It was just the most massive thing I've ever seen. I, to tell you the honest truth, I thought, well, we're the only ones left on this planet. Something's happened. We've missed something here. The fear that went in me when I seen it was just, um, like the feeling, I'd say it was fear, but I've never felt that feeling before in my entire life. It's a weird feeling, like you can't explain it when you don't know. You feel like you're being followed, but you don't know what it is. We had two to our right, another one in front of us, another one to the left, and another one just across the road, shaking the daylight out of the tree. All we get was a big red eye. I remember waking up and looking at the end of the bed and there was a figure there, almost insect-like, and then I blacked out. Welcome to the show, everyone. My name is Cade Moyer, and you are listening to the Believe Paranormal and UFO podcast. If you have had an encounter and would like to share it, please get in touch with me. My email address is believepod at gmail.com. If you enjoy the podcast, be sure to leave us a rating or review wherever you listen and head on over to our website, believepod.com, and consider becoming a member to get bonus episodes and video content. Tonight, I'm joined by Kieran, and Kieran is a bit of a war historian, and he came across a rather unique piece of World War I history and has quite a tale to tell with it. So, Kieran, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kay. That's uh, it's great uh, being on the show. Mate, it's fantastic to have you on. We've been talking before we hit record for about 20 minutes now, and I feel like we are the oldest of friends. Mate, you are one of the most spectacular talkers i've ever met the way the way that you just kind of speak about the the encounters that you've had is so so incredible and so powerful because what we're going to talk about tonight is a is a rather unique and interesting kind of encounter which i which i always love when it comes to the show because i always try to put unique and different stories on here and yours is definitely one of those but i have a feeling we're probably going to get you back on again because you you have kind of spilled the beans to me that you have a whole bunch of other things that have happened to you essentially but tell me what happened here with this world war one collectible that you've got no worries well look how about i'll start right from the beginning um because it's 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 probably pretty important to, to, to really paint the picture of it, how it all fell into place as you said I, I i do collect war memorabilia and i have done since i was about six year old you know my, my father gave me a, a little collar badge rising sun and that was the very first thing i i well you know that, that actually belonged to his stepfather and from there you know my interest grew <laughs> just, just from a badge and i, I just like collecting things you know and I'd, I'd go to antique shops and all this sort of stuff and I'll just go looking for things and I'd, I'd read books, you know, I, I still have a really big book collection and my interest just grew and grew and grew and look, I, over the years, I, I just I just really started collecting, probably more so when I hit my teens, when I became an apprentice and I could actually go out and, and start really buying things. But my my interest really sort of kicked off when I, I started collecting sections of postcards and you know, diaries and documents and, and, and things like this. Now, I these things don't just get locked away. I, you know, when I was in my teens, I, I would actually, I'd go to schools or, or give talks and that sort of stuff. And so I'd, I'd actually go and produce my on my collection and and uh, you know, show school kids, you know, like, you know like swords and and yeah, you know, the, the uniforms and bits and pieces, and just to you know, give them a, a little bit of an idea of what it was like to be, be a soldier during the First World War or the Second World War or so forth. Um, and so th- th- this is really where, you yeah, know, my, my real interest, you know, really kicked off. It was probably more so in, in my teens when I was studying uh, history at high school and getting a real, real good feel for, for, for this sort of stuff. And it was actually during one of these occasions when I was actually at a school with, with an exhibit and, and I was, you know, talking to a heap of students that my, my parents actually turned up just to be asked to what was happening because you know, so I was still only a teenager at the time. And it just so happened there was a, another older gentleman who turned up who was actually my dad's old butcher. And now this is a, you know, a funny sort of connection, but that this man actually stood back and watched what I was doing and how I was, uh, I was interacting with, with, with all these kids. And he just came and approached me and he said, look, I've got something that yes, you might like. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, yeah. And he just, he just vanished. No, no, so did he uh, talk to me and he just disappeared. And about 20 minutes later, he, he just turned up. 
And he said, look, I've got this. I don't really have anyone to, to pass it on to. I want it to be, to be safe. I'd like you to have it. And he just handed me over this, this little booklet. And, and, and he just sort of stood there and he just nodded his head and he said, this belonged to my, my uncle. And, um, he died during the First World War. Yeah, I'm sure that you look after it. And with that, he pretty much just turned back, turned and, and walked away. So th this was, yeah. <laughs> this was a, a little, little bit of a shock at the time. Here, here I was, I was only about 19 years old. And, and when I opened up the book, the, this little diary, it was, it was actually a First World War diary, but it was a First World War battlefield diary. And it had belonged to a soldier through, from Victoria, a country of Victoria. He was from, he was from a place called Talangada. And uh, now Talanga there is actually, I believe it's in Mulberry, but eventually a portion of Talanga went under, went, actually went underwater when they brought the Snowy River scan through. So they, they actually shifted the, the actual town centre about six kilometres in, in a different direction. So, but Talanga still does exist as, as a town, but a, a, lot of, a lot of it actually got side shifted. So, but getting back to the, to the story, it belonged to a, to a young gentleman. At the time of him writing the diary, he was only 19 years old. And his name was James Council. Now, at, at this point, where the diary actually starts with him doing his basic training in, in Egypt. And he had been assigned to the, the 5th Australian Battalion. Now, what the, what the diary doesn't actually tell you is that he'd already enlisted in a, a previous battalion where he'd actually gone out to Egypt. And he was actually being prepared to, to, to go to Gallipoli. All his mates went to Gallipoli. He didn't. He actually he had developed a bit of an infection. Uh, whilst he was ha having bit of fun in Egypt, and he was actually sent home. But they put him on, on a ship and sent him home. And uh, but yeah, you know, when he uh, arrived back in Australia, the c condition had actually cleared up. They reassigned him to a, uh, to a different battalion, which was the fifth. And off he went. He, he was sent back over. This time he went to his basic training in, in Egypt once again, and then he was uh, shipped off to France. So so you know, 19 years old. Uh, you know, that's it's, it's you know, quite phenomenal to, to think that you know people at that age were being sent off to war, but. Uh, it does appear with, with the, the whole story that when you you actually look through his uh, service records, which I do now have, there is a, there's this, a piece of paper which basically says, I give my son permission to be a soldier, signed. It's, it's almost like a signed Mr. Council or something like that. So it, it almost even seems because you, you, you actually have to be 21 to enlist without your parents' permission. So I don't know how legit this, this permission note was uh, that was actually written by his father. But that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. He, you know, I, I kind of can't really answer that question. But so he was actually assigned to the 5th Battalion and the, you know, he, he ended up in France. Now, I didn't actually know any, any of this at the time. Basically, the only details that I, I could actually find out back in, you know, back in the, in the 90s was very, very, very basic details, which was the fact that he, he was actually kill, killed in action. And he was killed in action on the 25th of July, 1916. Now, I knew that, that this was actually the, the Battle of Poziers. And the, the Battle of Poziers is, was one of the most horrific battles that the Australians took part in. It's actually C.E.W. Bean, who was the, 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 the main war historian you know, for, for the First World War. He actually describes Poziers as the, the, the there was what, well, there hasn't been another place in, in the world where there was more blood sown in, in the fields other than Poziers. Yeah, we had 23,000 casualties there. You know, oh, wow. In, in, in a matter of six weeks. So it was just mind blowing, mind blowing. So, but, but this, this diary, I mean, it, it is quite fascinating. And he actually does spend these. So, I said he was 19 when, when he enlisted, he, he went across and, you know, he, the, the, the time frame is, is quite incredible. But he, he does actually spend his 21st birthday in this little town called Albert. And the Albert, now, when I mentioned that this town of Albert, that will come into the, the, the story on, on going progressively a little, a little bit later on. But, but he spent his 21st birthday there and he actually makes mention of this in his diary. And then he moves up to the front line, which was captured by, you know, the, the, the German trenches, which had been previously captured by, I think it was the, I believe it, it may have been the second battalion. But they actually moved up into, into support, into the, the old German front line. And then the diary actually states, on the 24th of July, 1916, it actually says, we hop over tonight, God knows what the end will be. And that is the, the last entry. You know, that the records state that he lost his life on the, on the 25th. So, and he turned the page over and he actually states, he has like a bit of a, 
a last, you know, a, a last will, you could say, where he actually asks the event he happens to him for the diary to be passed on to his mother, uh, and the, he gives a, an address in, in Thalangala, Victoria. So, mate, just to be given this diary was was mind blowing at my age, and uh, I almost immediately felt whenever it was Anzac Day or any, whenever, whenever it was any sort of like commemoration. I just felt I, I had to put this diary in, in the pocket. I had my heart and attend all these ceremonies. So whether it was a dawn service or a, a, a Remembrance Day service, I would always carry the diary with me. So I, I did carry on you know, giving you know, talks and doing exhibits, that sort of stuff. Um, and then uh, I met my, my future wife. Yeah, you know, we got married. And she, you know, we... we we actually got the travel bug, and my, my wife actually suggested that, yeah, why don't we go over and go 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 over to France, yeah, to the battlefields of France. And I said that would be amazing. So we we did, yeah, we saved up our, our hard-earned dollars, and then we we planned a trip. But we actually planned the, our trip through France around his diary. So the places that he went to throughout his diary, we actually made the point of going to those places. Oh wow! And the in fact the the town of Albert, where he spent his twenty-first birthday. Is where we actually set ourselves up. We we based ourselves out of the pub in Albert, and that was that was our, our little you know, um, starting point to, to to go to all these you know, places there throughout, throughout France. And that 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 alone was you know, pretty amazing. Just the fact that we we're over there, the fact the fact that my, my lovely wife was happy to go on and walk around sandwiches with me on a on an overseas holiday. I think that else yeah, you know, a lot of wives probably wouldn't do that. But mate, I think you've um, struck gold there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I, I won't admit that too much, mate. But the, <laughs> she, she might be wishing, <laughs> so, but yeah, no, she was yeah, pretty, pretty fantastic. Yeah, yeah, giving directions and that sort of stuff. Because yeah, some of those little uh, back, back country roads in France were a, a little, little bit difficult to find, and yeah, we, we, we'll work off off of what was essentially little mud mats finding our way around. So, but, yeah, when we got to France, so this is back in 1999. So yeah, like I said, I was given the diary of it probably about uh, probably about seven years prior to this. And I had you know, utilised it, you know, for, for ceremonies, giving talks and that sort of stuff. And then when I went to France, I actually took a transcript. I didn't take the diary itself. I actually took a transcript with me. And so, you know, we, we started off going, just going to a few different cemeteries, going to a few museums. We, we were trying to work ourselves in amongst some pretty ordinary weather as well. So when it was raining, we'd go in indoors. And when it was uh, good weather, we, we'd go outdoors. And and we, we had been to other cemeteries previous, but... It was when I went to the Posnia Cemetery that things, yeah, interesting things happened there. Um, now, the, the Posnia Cemetery, unlike a lot of other cemeteries, is actually surrounded by, by marble walls. And, uh, you know, and on those walls are the names of the, the, the British Fifth Army that was wiped out during the, the April, April March offensives, you know, during 1918. So, but the interior, there's about 2,700 graves and a good portion of those men are actually Australians because it was actually the, the Australians that which launched the, the attacks during 916 at so, so naturally, a lot of the graves situated around, around the, in, inside the cemetery are Australian. Now, I knew that my soldier, James Council, didn't have a known grave. And, 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 and like I said, at this stage, that was all I knew. He didn't have a known grave, which could mean that he was buried in an unmarked grave. He could be, he could be buried out in the field. His bones his might have my, my been churned up by ploughs in, 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 the, in, you know, in, the, in the fields, which is quite often what happens these days. It was, you know, it was all, all speculation. So we got to this cemetery at Posiers, and me and my wife, we were walking around inside the cemetery, and it just felt funny. Unlike all the, all the other cemeteries, uh, there was just a weird feel to this place. And I started to get a little, little just a little bit emotional, and... I looked at my wife, and she was sort of diagonally across from, from where I was. And I, I, I just started walking over towards her, and I started walking up this this one row, and I started to hyperventilate. Now I'm I'm not an asthmatic or anything like that, like that, I, but I, I was I was struggling to breathe. And mate, I broke out into goosebumps. I felt sick, but I I, I actually collapsed. Yeah, I I was. Dead set struggling with my wife, who, yeah, you know, she's actually a nurse. Yeah, you know, she saw me collapse and she ran. Yeah, you know, she, she ran from, yeah, you know, from one side of the other to, to, to where, I, where I was. And here I was, I was down on one knee. 
And mate, it was the, it was the weirdest, weirdest experience. But before my wife actually got to me, here I was, I'm, I'm struggling to breathe. And I felt someone put their hand on my shoulder. And look, the only th the only way I can really de de describe it now, mate, whenever I talk talk about this, I break out with goosebumps, and and that's exactly what's happened to me now. I and I'm I'm feeling sick. That's <laughs> it's, it's, it's bizarre. I, I knew this was going to happen. This this always happens whenever I tell the story. So yeah, you know, if I if I sound a bit jittery while I'm talking, that this is this is just what happens. So so I, here I am. I'm, I'm on my knee. You know, I've dropped down to my knee, and. The, the only thing, like I said, the, the way I can describe it is, and this might sound really silly, my, my, my grandma always had really cold hands. And, and yeah, and she'd, she'd, yeah, if she saw you, yeah, standing somewhere, somewhere like she'd, she'd, you know, she'd put her hands around you know, on, on your belly. Or, yeah, just, uh, you know, just to put the cold hands on you. Yeah, just because she knew that she always had cold hands. And, and th this is what it was like. It was like someone had slipped their hand up your shirt <laughs> and put the hand on my shoulder. But, yeah, you know, what? But, that, yeah, so it was, it, it, it sounds silly. But that's the only way I could really describe it. It was, it was like someone put, put their cold hand on my, on my, on my bare shoulder. But mind you, this is, yeah, winter time. It was about, yeah, five or six degrees of time. And, and I was wearing a polar police jacket. So, um, but it felt like someone put the, you know, their, their cold hand on my shoulder. And made, that made me freak. Because when I looked around, there was no one there. And, and it was not only at that, that point, I, I looked at my, like, looked at my left hand side. And beside me was a grave. And the grave was of a, uh, an Australian soldier, the 5th Australian Battalion. And he was flanked by other soldiers, also of the 5th Australian Battalion, who were killed on the 25th of July 1916. Now, this is the same battalion that James Council was, was a part of. And it's the same date that he actually lost his life. And so, mate, my wife got to me. She's, she basically said, what the, what the hell's happening? And, and she could see I was, I was a mess. And my wife said to me, she goes, the atmosphere isn't right here. We have to get out. And she grabbed me by the arm. She helped me fit to my feet, which is, yeah, no mean feet. But I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm six foot seven and, and you know, built like a brick shit house. And, but she helped me to my feet and she walked me out. And the moment we could, we stepped outside that, that cemetery, everything got calm. And uh, so we just sort of, we just sat outside, I composed myself a little bit, and it was nice because there was actually a couple of English people, you know, turned up to, you know, look at the cemetery as well. And it was actually the first English I'd spoken in a couple of weeks. So I was, I was able to, you know, sort of converse with these people and have a bit of a chat. And then I actually said to my wife, I said, look, I've got to go back in there and take a photo. And she goes, no, you're not going back in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, no, no, look, I've got to do it. I've just got to do it. So I walked back in. And I found where it was because you know, I still be knee marks on the ground. And I, I actually took a photograph um, of the the unknown soldier and, and the, the other soldiers that yeah, were, were side by side. Now, I didn't actually take any notice of any of the other names, um, but I was more interested in, in this unknown soldier. And uh, like I said, by the yeah, just talking about it, it, it rattles me. But that was one thing. The, the, the rest of the whole day was, was amazing. Yeah, you know, we we travelled around France. I went to England, Scotland, Ireland. Yeah, we 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 you know, we we you know, we went went all over the place, and we went absolutely ball. Basically, got back home, and all, almost yeah, you know, within twelve months, yeah, you know, we'd started a family, and you know, things sort of yeah, you know, quietened down a little bit. Then you know, I, even with my collecting, I, I didn't really sort of collect as much as what, what I used to because we were trying to save money, and yeah, you know, with the mortgage and stuff. So it wasn't up until it was probably a good eight nine years, I suppose, later that when when my kids really actually. A little bit less than that because we, 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 when we started having kids, when, when as soon as my kids started going to school, my my my, my children would actually ask me if they could take items of, of, of my collection to school to for, for show and tell. So, so you, yeah, you can imagine like the teachers yeah, scratching their head when the, the kids turn up with a German helmet or a helmet or a gas mask or a, yeah. So so, but as it got close to the Anzac Day, or then the school then approached. Um, yeah, my, my wife and said, look, where, where's all the stuff coming from? And she said that, you know, about me having a big collection and the way we went, you know, I, I then started uh, putting on the exhibits again. And once again, I was able to pull out the diary and and, and really, yeah, tell the kids about, you know, about the First World War and, and its effect on, on families. 
and so forth. But it was also, look, around about this time that the internet improved, I could actually gain access to service records, like really good service records, not just very basic ones. And that was where I was able to go and get like the full service records of James, James Council. And I was really able to, to, you know, work around that and work out exactly where, where he was, uh, where he was from, so forth, so forth. But this is where it got really interesting because um, it was just one night when I was having a really good delve into his service records that I uh, I actually noticed that he actually had a known grave at some point. So he'd been buried in the field. And, and when he was buried in the field, whoever had buried him had actually made a point of recording his burial coordinates. So... Oh, in, in his service records, it actually says he's buried on the field and with map reference and has a map reference number. Now, this would, you know, like narrow it down to like just a, like a square. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not even exactly sure just how big that square would have been. But, yeah, I, I, you, you could actually pinpoint on the map roughly where he was buried. But, of course, his grave was lost. Now, it was around about this time, too, that I, I actually uh, was reading through um, a magazine. I, I actually have got the magazine in front of me. It was a wartime magazine, and uh, and this is actually like dated uh, 99. So, now, in, in this in this mag- magazine, uh, I was actually having, having a look through it, and there was, a, lo and behold, there, here, here was a story about a soldier from, from the 5th Battalion. And a lot of the stuff that, that, that is actually mentioned in his diary um coincides with, with my diary, with with my soldier's diary. Now the service records that I also had obtained told me one really, really important thing, and that's the fact that James Council was a Lewis machine gunner. He worked in in, in, in a Lewis section. Uh, and with, with his Lewis machine gun sections, they were a light machine gun. They had like a big uh, round cylindrical magazine that they mounted on, on on top. And these these were essentially like the, the very first mobile light machine gun which was actually carried by by crews of men during the first world war you know they had heavy machine guns but these were the light ones which yeah would be would be carried now they, these soldiers would actually work in 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 sections so you would have like uh, say there might be seven riflemen and you would have the like number one and the number two who would actually handle the lewis machine gun now every bloke in that section could handle that gun to some extent but the number one and the number 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 two were, were the blokes who would operate the gun the other blokes would actually support it with rifle fire and they would actually carry all the, all the ammunition. Now, James Council was one of these men. He was in the Lewis gun section, um, which meant that I was actually able to, to narrow things down because at this point in, in the war, um, there weren't that many Lewis gun sections allocated to, to a battalion of, of a thousand men. I mean, in fact, I think there was, there was four companies of say about 225 men and each of those companies may have two Lewis gun sections. So, yeah, the, the that was that was really interesting. But what was even more interesting is this story that I was, I was actually reading about this soldier. His name was George Lundy. He was also a, a member of a Lewis gun section. And you know, it, it, it just when, when I'm reading through the, this story, he go yeah. You know, once again, he's actually fighting in the, in the Battle of Poitiers. Now, this this man survived. But his description is quite amazing of what was actually happening throughout this battle. But there was one thing which really hit home, and I don't know why, I don't know why it hit home, but when I was reading about it, he actually mentions that on the 25th, 25th of July 1916, when they had gone into action, his own Lewis machine gun section had all been wiped out. They got hit by a big shell. Everyone was dead or dying. And he was, right, he was working his way through these battered trenches because he'd heard there was there was another Lewis gun section that was off to his left hand side, so he was yeah you know, running through these trenches, and when he got there, his best mate was laying in, in this trench, and this and his best mate had, had his legs blown off, was bleed, bleeding to death, and this uh, this section everyone in that section was was wounded badly, or like either dead or badly badly wounded, and and he was devastated because he was his mate, with his legs blown off, the gun was also shattered, so there was no of any use to him. But yeah, but his job was to try and get a get a yeah get past to try and get his gun back in action so they, they can go and repel this counterattack that we were snapping from the Germans. So he was devastated to think that he actually left his mate behind. Now this bloke, he had a really unusual surname. 
and this is what really caught my caught, uh, what caught my attention. His surname, well, his name was Charles George Ruggles. And when I saw this name, I thought to myself, "What? What the hell? How do I know that name? How do I know that name?" And like this, this baffled me for a bit, and and then all of a sudden, it's it's hit me. And I went and grabbed my photograph album, you know, from when I was in France. And uh, here I was, I was, uh, yeah, I, I, I flicked through the, to the photograph that I, I went and took when I walked back into the cemetery. And the soldier who was laying next to the unknown soldier was Charles George Ruggles. No. So, so when you look at these things, so, you know, my man was a Lewis machine gunner. George Ruggles was also a Lewis machine gunner. They worked in sections. Ruggles' crew was all wiped out and, and dead or dying. Now, the other really bizarre thing was when I was looking through George Ruggles' service records, I, I then you know, produced his records and started flicking through them. Lo and behold, in his notes is the fact that he too was buried in the field because, of course, he, yeah, he has no grave. But there's a map reference with burial co- coordinates on, on in, in a battlefield, and they are identical to Range Council's burial coordinates. So these two men were actually buried buried in the, in the, in the same place. That's incredible. James just, Council. Just James logistically, Council. for that to happen, that is incredible. Yeah, and it's something I, I haven't really come across in, in, in many other service records that I've got, the fact that they had made a point of writing down his burial coordinates in, in his service records, and then that make you know, and then of course he, his grave was lost. But here it is, two men from the fifth battalion, both Lewis and others, both with the same burial coordinates, and and here it is. This is it's right next to Ruggles, in the Posia Cemetery that I have this weird experience. That has to be one of the most intricate synchronicities I have ever heard of. Yeah, and and look, this is and once again now I've got the goose stuff, mate. Um, it's sorry, I'm thinking it's the, it's the sort of thing that just when I talk about it, it, it rattles me. And I, I've, I've spoken to like yeah, you know, like a few people about this, and and uh, so what does, what what's it feel like? And I'll say, so, yeah, you know, it feels like I have someone sitting next to me. And that, that's it's 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 bizarre. I'm sitting on lounge now, and I feel like someone's sitting with me. That's that's how I feel. And I'm, I'm I'm starting to tear up a little bit now, but that's that's that just it's it's really bizarre, mate. So it doesn't it doesn't really end there. So like I said, I, I thought you know I, I felt that was something that I, I couldn't prove, but because this soldier is already buried in, a, in, a, in an unknown grave and he's in a cemetery, there, there there's no way of doing any DNA testing to retrieve his body and finding finding relatives and so forth. So yeah, so. I think, you know, like deep down in my own mind, I, you know, I, I, even at this point, I felt that had to be him. Like, just the fact that I, I had the hand on my shoulder in the cemetery when I was following his footsteps, at that point, I, I felt that had to be him. But this just, you know, me with my, yeah, my, you know, my interested mind and, 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 you know, I love researching things. When I start piecing all this together, it's, wow, this is, this is incredible. So, so, like I said, you know, I've I've always, you know, I've always, you know, put his diary on on displays. I've always given talks about him. I've I've, I've always made the point of the fact that he's never been forgotten. Not most, you know, the diaries are in, in my possession. I've always told his story. I've always made the point of making sure that the kids understand, you know, just how bloody horrible the First World War and and and, and any war is. Yeah, I use, I, I've, I've always used his diary as a, as the as the, the real big turning point to really make them understand. So, uh, mate, I'm going to jump forward a few years. So, my son is a very very talented bugler, and so he was actually given the opportunity to sound the last post at the Australian War Memorial, and this is like a huge honour. I mean, yeah. When I think of places to the sound of the last post, Gallipoli is number one. Bill's Bretno in France is number two. You know, there's the Australian Memorial there. Maybe the, the, the Men in Gate, but, you know, one of the utmost, you know, incredible places to, to be able to go and do this. 
is the Australian War Memorial. And, and, and so he was given the opportunity to, to go and do that. So, of course, all the family, yeah, we, we all yeah, went, to the, went to Canberra. Yeah, this is, this is a big occasion. My, my son was, I believe, he was the, the second oldest. Oh, sorry, the, or the, sorry, the second youngest, I should say. The second youngest bugle to, to ever sound the last post. One more. So this is, this is, this is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So, but yeah, my, my son's actually, yeah, taking his, his own bugle there. He's, he stood up on the day, sounded the last post beautifully. But I was actually given the opportunity to, to go and lay a reef. And I didn't actually tell any of the family, you know, you know what I'd done. They, they said I could dedicate it to, to the reef to anyone. I actually dedicated the, the reef to James Council. Thanked him for his service and for his, you know, for his sacrifice and said that he'd never be forgotten. I actually wrote this on the little card, put it on the reef, and that's what we laid, laid at the, the, at the Wobble War on this particular day. Huge honour. It was a huge honour for myself to be able to go and do something like that. But mate, I was so proud to see myself up there, you know, sounding, sounding the last post. And in, his, in, his, in the pocket over his heart, he actually carried the photograph of James Council. Oh, wow. So that was, that was a big thing. Yeah, that's, now, that's, that's amazing. Now, the, the following day, um, we actually went back to the memorial because at the end of this, the, the closing ceremony, they, they basically shut, they shut the place up really quick. And so I, we actually went back the following morning. I took the diary, the, the, the original diary with me. We, we found his name on the on you know, on the, the the big memorial plaques on on the wall, and my my, my two sons were there, my mum was there, my, my my wife was close by, and I said to my I said to my boys, yeah, can you maybe take take my photograph with his name, yeah, you know, on the wall? And I said, yeah, yeah, no worries, Dad. Yeah, so they they got the cameras ready, and I, I, I you know I, I crashed down, opened up the diary to his last entry. So they, they they took a, they, they took the photo, and then the, the one thing that was really spooky was in the background, the war memorial had playing. They they had done recordings of school children from all local schools um, reading out the names of soldiers. So, for instance, you know the Bob might say you know you have Joe Blow, Second Battalion, with with his with his age, and they would you know, say say you know, someone else's name, and yeah. You know, yeah, the battalion that they served with, and their age. And this is this is just standing in the background, and it's, it's, it's saying like little kids, you know, like little, you know, they, they almost sound like yeah, first, second class kids, just reading out these names. So this is playing in the background. So my sons have taken the photograph. I've, I've stood back up, and then a name was read out: James Council, Fifth Battalion, twenty-one years of age. Another synchronicity. And. My mum looked at me and she said, "Did you just hear that?" And she know, yeah, you know, and she she was aware of what what happened in, in France and, and and the the other the strange things that happened and and mate, immediately I, yeah, like I am now, goosebumps and I started feeling sick. And it's like, what the hell? This is, yeah. And so we we actually made the point of going to the going to the the, the memorial shop and we said to them, these. The, 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 the kids' voices and all these names, and they said, "Oh yeah, no, we the memorial had a had a thing going where they approached all the local schools here around the region, and of the hundred thousand names, they were able to get about ten thousand names." And I'm just wow. <laughs> so out of ten thousand names, his name was read out the moment I stood at the wall at, at this at, at his name on, on the. The brass clock for the fifth like the, the strong memorial. The, the moment I stood in front of it and opened that diary up was the name was, was his name was read out. You know, Kieran, I believe coincidences happen, but when a coincidence happens, not once, not twice, but three times, that's no longer a coincidence in my eyes. That is the that's the universe reaching out to you. And now, a quick word from our sponsor. Also, are you wanting more content? Why not become a Believe Plus member? You'll get access to exclusive podcasts and episodes that aren't available to the public. Not only that, you'll also get our regular feed without any ads. Head to believepod.com forward slash plus to sign up today for just $5 a month. That's exactly right. But wait, there's more. So this was 2020. This happened. It was just people going private hit and, and really shut the place down. So, yeah, we've gone a few years. 
or a couple of years anyway. Last, now, last year, of all places, my, my wife and I and the group of friends went to the Northern Territory. We went to Darwin, you know, travelled around Kakadu, so forth. On our last night, we actually went to a place called Beer. And, and this is a very spiritual place in, in, in Kakadu. It's a you know, beautiful rock formation. There's uh, indigenous rock art there. It's it's one of the most incredible places oh. I've ever been to. And it... Th- the only way I could really, you know, I, I, I could really describe it would be like a massive pride rock, you know, from from the, from, from Lion King. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where this this big rock had basically fallen down on top of another, like another rock, and, and so you can actually walk on top of this thing. You can probably fit about a thousand people on, on top of this rock, but they people go, yeah, you know, they 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 encourage people to go up there and watch the sunset, and and that's exactly what we did there. We went we, we went there just before sunset, had a little bit of a walk around. And they walked up on top of the shrub with, with, with everyone else that was there. And there was probably there was probably about 50, 60 people up on up on top of the shrub. And it was it was just one of these really nice moments where everyone was taking photographs for, for each other, yeah, whether you knew them or not. And yeah, we're all just talking to each other. It was just a really the the vibe was, was just beautiful. And whilst we were up there, uh, there was a, a a group of school kids and the and their teachers that were, were close by. And one of them they came and stood next to my wife. My wife said, would you like me to take a photograph for you? And I think she, she did, yeah. And then my wife said to her, whereabouts are you, are you guys from? And she just looked and she goes, oh, we're from Tulangada, which is the hometown of James Council. And I immediately, immediately, I felt sick and I broke out the goosebumps. And it was at this point I said to my wife, because this, this teacher then excused herself and she she raced off and, and yeah, did something with, with, with the kids. And I, I, looked at, I looked at my wife and she just said, what's going on? And I said, do you know where Thwangler is? And she, and she just sort of shook her head and I said, that's, that's, where, that's where my soldier's from. I said, look at me. I feel sick. I've got covered in bloody goosebumps. I said, I've got to do something. She, and, and she's saying, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm just going to go talk to someone, and that's exactly what I did. I, I actually went and I walked in the, in the direction of a male school teacher that was with some of the students, and I just approached him and and I, 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 I just introduced myself. He, yeah, I, I won't say his real name, but I'll say his name's John. Yeah, he actually introduced himself. He introduced himself back, so forth. And we just got yakking, and I said to him, "Oh, I said, mate, I've got be, I'm going to be up front with you." This is a really weird story. So you have to, you know, bear with me. And I, I proceeded to tell him, you know, about, 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 about the diary I had, where it was from, the things that happened to me over, you know, overseas, you know, without going into too much detail. But I said, mate, look, basically, ever since I've had this diary and ever since I've been to France, weird shit's happened. I said, not, not just all in one hit, this is, but, you know, this is over like a 20 year period. But strange things have happened, and now this has happened. I said, now I'm, I'm going to show you my arms. I'll, you know, I'll show you my arms. I said, man, I'm, I'm covered in, in goosebumps. This is what happens to me. And he, he, he sort of stood there, and he said, wow, that's, that's incredible. He said, look, just out of curiosity, he said, what, what was that surname you just said? And I said, his name was James Council. And this this teacher, he looked at me, and he, he basically said, fuck off. <laughs> I, I said, Sorry? He goes, you're kidding me. I said, no, I'm not kidding. I said, his name's James Council. And he looked at me and he goes, it's spelled D-A-U-S-S-B-L-L. I said, yes, that's exactly right. And he said, look, without making too much of a thing, he said, turn around and look behind you. I turned around and looked behind you and there was, there was a, you know, a couple of female students there. And he said, hey, the girls behind you are councils. Oh, my God. I just got chills, Kieran. So, and at that point, I said, look, I'm, I won't say anything to the, to the students. Just in case, I said, yeah, it's going to be pretty weird having just a, a random bloke walk up and talk to them about this. He said to me, he said, look, my dad loved his family history. Would you like to pass on some details to me and I'll have a chat with my dad and we'll do what we can research and find out for you. I said, that would be fantastic. And I said, look, I said, are you a history teacher? And he said, yeah, I am. He said, oh, that, that's what he majored in, but he wasn't actually teaching history. But he said, but I I, I am a history teacher, but uh, I don't teach at, at present. He said, but my best friend does. 
he's actually a history teacher at the same school. And I said, look, this is happening for a reason. I don't know why this is happening, but I, I feel like maybe his story should be told in, in his hometown. And he said, we, we would, yeah, we would love to have that sort of information that can be passed on to our own students. He said, look, this is, this is what we, we, we crave, like local stories like this. So I, I actually, I, I got his, his, his details and I actually emailed everything off to him. And, and he said, look, he, yeah, he said, but yeah, give me a buzz in a couple of weeks and we'll, we'll, we'll have a bit of a catch up and I'll, I'll have a chat with my dad and so we can find out. I said, okay, look, that, that'll be great. So that, that was good. Yeah, two weeks later, you know, I've, I've got back, you know, uh, yeah, we, we had a fantastic time. That was funny. I was actually at work and I received a text message from, from John and it basically said, can you give me a call this afternoon? Weird shit's already started to happen. And yeah, that, that had me intrigued. <laughs> so I was missing back to the city. Yeah, yeah, okay, no worries. What, about 4.30? He said, yep, that, that'd be great. So um, I got back home that afternoon, immediately jumped on the phone and I gave John a call. And he pretty much said to me, he said, go get yourself a beer and go and sit down. <laughs> he, said, he said, you're not going to believe this. I said, right, yeah, okay, hit me with it. He said, so first up, the two students that were, were behind you were definitely you know, relations of the council family. I said, okay, that's that's quite incredible. He said, yeah, they was a large family. Uh, the, 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 the soldier was one of one of nine children. And there's actually lots of, yeah, there's yeah, quite a few descendants that, that still exist in, in, in Tawangala. He said, wow, okay, that's that's fantastic. That's, that's really good though. He said, that doesn't end there, Kieran. I said, okay. And then he, he proceeded to tell me that he, when he got home, he actually called up his dad, went out for, for dinner with him. Yeah, they, they went out a few beers. And he, he, he produced all the, you know, because I was in photographs of the, the diary and all the, all the pages and, and the transcript and, and, and the stories. And look, every, you know, because you know, I've written stories about, about what happened in France. So I sent everything off to him. And he produced all this and he, he read all this out to his father. And his father saw sat back there just, you know, sipping on his beer and, in the, in the end, his father said to him, he said, John, you, you don't know, do you? And, and he's, you know, John's like, look at his dad, saying, what, what, what's wrong, dad? What, what do you mean? And he said, you honestly don't know, do you? And he's like, no, dad, what, what don't I know? He said, John, you, you, you know, you know, like, you know, years ago, our family, because, you know, that, that, what, 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 John actually told me that his family, went back generations in, in Tulangla, so he was like a born and bred Tulangla boy. Now, John, John's father proceeded to then tell him that when it wasn't all that, all that long ago, you know, within the last 30, 40 years, their family had actually purchased uh, a farm that was their neighbours, the, the, the neighbouring farm. And and John's saying, yeah, what, what about that? And he said, that was the council farm. He said, John, we actually purchased the council farm. The land that we live on now is the council, the council land. This is getting nuts, Karen. And just to really top it off, he said, now, you know how you used to jump on your motorbike and ride around the fences? And John said, yeah, I, I, I do. He said that the occupation of James Council was a boundary rider. He said, so essentially, you know, when you used to go and uh, jump on your motorbike and ride around the fences and yeah, check all the fences. He said, you're, you're, you're a boundary rider. So you've been approached by a person who you don't know thousands and thousands and thousands of kilometres away on a rock in the Northern Territory. Well, you know, this person you don't, you don't know from Paris, so has approached you, asked you a, a, about a soldier from the First World War. It just so happens that his occupation was the same as your occupation on the same farm. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm speechless. This is, this is so far out of being normal that it is almost impossible to to comprehend that this is real. No, no. <laughs> like, it is. No, it's, it's, it is like it is. It is so. There's so many strings connecting. So many people backed. To, to this one individual that it's it's such a 
a mind twisting story and I I am shocked by it. Out of everyone that you could have picked in your historical adventures, you chose this gentleman and it took you down this path. It is That's and and honest that's that and, and when I when I spoke to him on the phone and I said, no, I'm, I'm breaking that goosebumps again, mate, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, and, and that's what he said. He said, no, uh, it took me, you know, he said, I, I now understand what you're going through and, and what, what you've he said, because this is bizarre. He said, How, why is it you walked up to me? I said, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I said, I, I said, but when I, when I came up and spoke to you, John, I, 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 I felt sick and I broke out and, you know, I, I, I was covered in goosebumps. I said, so here it was. And he said, so, he said, yeah, that, 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 there were students behind you that are, are relations. And then you've approached me and my family owned the bloody farm. I said, I know. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it is so truly nuts. And I always, I, I, I think I even said it at, at the start of this episode, I always try to do episodes that are unique and different and, and kind of strange so people can kind of understand that they're not alone with their experiences but i have to tell you karen you've absolutely wiped the table of everything because nothing has ever come close to having so many synchronicities attached to it to in this podcast ever and ever and and look it's and and i think that's the that is the interesting thing about this there's something that physically i can never prove that this is him but through everything that's happened, I can't believe that it can't not be him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, like it's, it is almost and fate. And yeah, I mean, look, yeah, without yeah, you know, like sounding yeah, you know, like too weird with all this. I I was actually with I um, uh, met my wife and my, uh, my myself and, and my daughter. We actually went and visited the, an uncle and aunt down the, the, the south coast, and they had a friend pop over who was actually sensitive, you know, to do all this sort of stuff. And and I had actually told my auntie and uncle uh, about this, and it's uh, and it's, it's funny when, whenever I tell the story, I I often expect someone to have a, a reaction of oh that's all bullshit rah rah rah, but you know I, I've never ever had anyone ever say that to me. It's always been quite the opposite. It's like, wow, it has to be him, and and that, that's that's always been the reaction. Now this lady had uh, a, a very interesting sort of reaction when I was, was talking about her, about, uh, about what what had happened, and and the one thing that she actually said to me, she said, "I feel like he's maybe attached to himself to you." She said. Yeah, but that, that might explain why you break out the goosebumps, why you feel sick. She said, look, they're, they're, they're physical things, and yeah, maybe there, there's some sort of attachment. Maybe, maybe you know, you actually maybe you may have attached yourself to you in France. I don't know. That's, 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 <laughs> It's one of those things that, and, and you really do, you have to be a, a really big believer of what, you know, that person is telling you because... I, I, you know, I am always on the fence when it comes to people who say that, you know, they're sensitive and then they give out information based off that because I always think that's yeah. a, that's a really dangerous route to, to kind of go down because we're, not to say people are lying, but maybe they are just misunderstanding what, yeah. what they're feeling. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's totally normal. Like you, you look at anyone and they can totally misread a, a situation. It's just kind of part of being human. Mm. But I tell you what, it, it definitely does sound like something is with you because who knows? Like, I wonder, and this is complete speculation, Kieran, but I wonder if you've had so many sliding door scenarios where you've decided to do something over something else that's led you to another kind of thread of synchronicities for this individual. Yeah. Yeah. And and did you know what 
I mean, there, there's a, like a few other little things which which have happened, which is just just little like bizarre things. And I, I look back now. I mean, it was only last year that my my daughter uh, for a school assignment, and it was a it was for an exhibit at the school for he, for he, history. She actually made a replica of this diary. I mean, she be, be, did a beautiful job of it. Like it's, it's like a, 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 sl, a, sl, a larger version of it. She actually stained all the all the paperwork with, with tea and coffee and stuff, and then yeah, wrote it in pencil and and, and wrote it the, the same as what he had written it, and and actually. We use that as as the an exhibit with the story of him with with, the, with photographs and that, and that sort of stuff, and even at, at this exhibit, which you know, we're, you know like I said we're, we're sort of you know in, in a fairly rural area of uh, our close to Newcastle, whilst we were there, and all these people were just you know just a, a handful of you know I wouldn't say there was hundreds of people there was you know a few people coming through looking at the, the at this exhibit after after hours at, at, at the school. A lady actually had a look at it and said, oh, I'm actually from Tlangala. <laughs> yeah. And, and, then, and then proceeded to tell me what you know, what the place was like and rah, rah, rah. And, and she said, oh, I don't recognize the name, but you know, that's really, yeah. But it, it, just little things like that. I mean, yeah. But so someone from, you know, from Tlangala is actually at, at the school. Uh, I don't know. Look, yeah, it's, maybe, maybe I'm looking too much into it. It's just, but look, what was... Also very nice when John finished telling me about what his father, yeah, told me about the farm and so forth. And and this really, this this really calmed me down for, for some reason. It really, it was, it was a really nice feeling when he actually said that the diary, the, the copies of the diary and, and the transcript and, and the stories are actually now being used at the length of the secondary college for teaching students. Oh wow, that is excellent! It's kind of so like he's ingrained his own history within his own town. Yes. So that was that was one thing. I was I was so emotional over that. It's like you kidding me? He goes, "Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's going to be used at school." An immense sense of pride about that, I would imagine, because you know you've you've taken this soldier who has essentially been forgotten to history and you've you've brought his story home and it's never going to be forgotten now yeah i know it's 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 yeah it's it's, it's it is pretty special i mean look I, i've always done my very best to, to make sure his story's told but you know i live in new south wales newcastle new south wales not and not, not, not victoria but to think that now it's his story is exactly being told at his hometown at the high school i think that's that, that is yeah pretty special but yeah, it's still it's still pretty freaky just how all this sort of stuff has, has fallen in, into place like it has. Um, yeah, it, it's yeah, I, I've got no way of really explaining how I feel with all that. That's it, it is pretty bizarre. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's one of those things that you may never know the answer to until who knows? One day, you you if you cross over and you ever find out that way. Because yeah. I tell you what, it, it definitely seems like there's some otherworldly things at play when it comes to to this. I know, I know that sounds very almost airy fairy and a little very very speculative, but I tell you, I tell you what, Kieran, I've never heard of a story with so many directional changes to make something happen in my life. Yeah. Like it is truly, truly fascinating, and I I just have. S- such difficulty comprehending it because I can only imagine how this was for you. Oh, mate, look, yeah, just, just the experience in France was enough for me. <laughs> 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 I mean, I mean, yeah, like I said, that, like, yeah, just having that, the hand on my shoulder in, in the cemetery and having no one there and, mate, that was that was enough to, to spook me. And, you know, look, I, I did nothing like that happened in any other cemetery. I never had any feelings like that. But that that one cemetery, it probably is. Mate, it, it just rattled me. That that really, really rattled me. But just to think that you know, it, everything else seems to have followed on. It's it's, it, it, it's almost like like floodgates have opened up since then, just with what little experiences. And I mean, you know, of, of course, you know, I was talking about some other things that, that, that have happened to me, but um, well, I, I can't say I, I ever really had anything anything happen until like this and 
Yeah, I've heard, you know, I've heard stories of you know, when, when you have your first experience that it can actually open the floodgates. It's almost like a beacon comes on and and uh, and you're, you're left wide, wide open to, to things. And, and mate, sometimes I just feel that that's that's exactly what what happens. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Believe Paranormal in UFO podcast. If you have had an encounter and you would like to share it, please get in touch with me. My email address is believepod at gmail.com. Finally, don't forget to follow us on all our social media outlets and be sure to join our Discord server to talk to other listeners of the show. You'll find all these links in our show notes. Thank you.